So, yeah, we're going to be talking about evidence for the resurrection, not the resurrection of Lazarus. He was not resurrected. He was only resuscitated. Very different. Okay, we're talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we're going to be looking at some reasons to say, hey, there's a lot of good reason to believe this. There's a lot of really, really strong argumentation to believe that this is something that really happened and that is a real historical event, not just some legend, myth, or fable. So, as we go along, I want to first just highlight that the resurrection is not just kind of important to the Christian faith. It is critically, vitally, and expunge the thesaurus for any other synonyms that would come along with those words, important for the resurrection. Uh, so, I, I just want to hit on a few key texts here that kind of show this. You guys are probably familiar with 1 Corinthians 15. If there's a resurrection chapter in the entire Bible that talks about the resurrection, the theology of the resurrection, it's that one. 1 Corinthians 15, 4, Paul says, And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. And so the faith that you guys, for the most part, that are all here and, and proclaim to be Christians, it's useless. It has no purpose whatsoever if it's not a historical fact that Jesus did indeed bodily raise from the dead. And he says later on in the chapter, he says, we're, be, we're to be more pitied than all if this really didn't happen, this whole event that the Christian faith hinges on. I think Jesus says two very interesting things right here. I don't have time to really dive into these, but I think it's interesting. And he kind of says, hey, like uh, the marker of the Christian faith is whether it's true or false is all kind of based upon whether or not I actually do do what I say I'm going to do when I say that I'm going to, you know, die, be buried, and then raise again. And so he says this here, if you remember, to a group of religious teachers. They're asking for a sign after he had just done a few. And he responds, says, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign. Obviously, he's referring to them. But none of them will be given, except none will be given, no signs, except the sign of the prophet of Jonah. We talked about Jonah. Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, and then he had life. Obviously, this is Jesus saying how he is, in a sense, greater than Jonah, and his sign is greater than the sign of Jonah. Okay? And he says that that, 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 that will be the sign. Okay? So so for the friend that you have that says, you know, I would really believe in God and the entirety of the Christian faith if he just gave me a sign. Say, so, yeah, well, Jesus, Jesus talked about people like you. Okay? Sign of Jonah. Let's, let's talk about the sign of Jonah. And so I've had lots of friends who I go into really deep conversations, and we, we have great conversations that are more than five minutes, more than an hour, over, let's talk about the sign of Jonah and the resurrection of Jesus. And um, a lot can be said for some of those conversations I'll get into later. Jesus says something kind of similar in John 2. Uh, he just cleared the temple, which is a pretty bold thing to do. And then the Jews say, hey, what, what gives you the right to do this? And he says, well, I'll tell you. How about you destroy the temple, and I'll raise it up again in three days. And uh, they give him a history lesson on how long it took to build the physical structure of the temple in Jerusalem. And he said, no, 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 I'm, I'm talking about my body. He's foreshadowing, obviously, his resurrection. And he's saying, because I will do that, I have authority right now to do this. Okay? And so again, we see throughout the entirety of the New Testament that the resurrection is key. The entirety of the Christian faith stands or falls on whether or not this really did indeed happen. So it's important. Okay? The argument that we're going to be going through for most of our time tonight is what some of you may have heard, you might be familiar with. It's oftentimes coined as, as the minimal facts argument. Um, if you guys are maybe familiar with uh, certain resurrection scholars, guys like Gary Habermas or N.T. Wright, these are kind of some of the proponents of this specific argument. Um, it's a case argument and it builds an entirety of a case, but you can also just take little pieces of it here and there as well in order to show that there's good reason to believe in the resurrection. So, the minimal facts definition. We're going to be looking at a few facts. Okay, We're going to be looking at five in particular. And here's why I call them facts. I call these things facts because the vast majority of contemporary scholars, both Christian and non-Christian, they call it a heterogeneous mix. Okay, so, so those from all camps, okay, those who are secular and those who are Christian, those who are from this side of the continent and that side of the 
the continent, all people who study this area would agree on these five facts. Anyone who studies in the relevant field of first century literature, first century history, would agree and acknowledge the historicity of these occurrences that we look at. We're going to look at five. So we're going to list them. And because I have uh, an education background, I always try and make something a little bit easier for someone to remember. I'm a big acronym guy. Where does DREAM come from? I don't know, but I made it up, so you better like it. <laughs> so all of these facts that we get, look at are going to go along with the acronym DREAM. So the first one we're going to look at is the one that starts with the D. I don't have any stickers or candy. If I did, I'd give it to the one who could guess what D is going to stand for. Any guesses? Disciple. Thanks for guessing, Cross. <laughs> but you're wrong. <laughs> Sorry. Alan, I feel like you should know. Death. The first thing that we're going to establish is that Jesus died. We had one back here. So the death of Jesus by crucifixion. If you guys have ever watched any sort of Christian, non-Christian debate on anything, there's probably a good chance that the non-Christian in the debate was Bart Ehrman. Okay? He is our day and age's most famous, most notorious Christian skeptic. And he says that we have 11 independent sources to testify to the death of Jesus within 100 years of the cross. Whether you name that at 30 AD or 33 AD, okay, it's kind of a moot point. Within 100 years of the cross of Jesus Christ, he says we have 11 independent sources, 11 independent literary pieces that say, hey, this is definitely something that happened. And he says to all those people out there who are on the internet, who are, you know, in their little groupie, who are saying, you know, maybe Jesus didn't actually die or didn't actually live, he goes, shut up. Okay, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's just like, you're not an actual historian if you're actually claiming to the whole, like, you know, pseudo-Jesus thing, he didn't actually really live or anything of this camp, okay? Obviously, every gospel account and the letters of Paul would be part of these 11 sources that testify to the death of Jesus. There's a lot of non-Christian sources that do, which obviously just bolster the case. Uh, there's a sampling of a few of them. Josephus and Tacitus would be two of your most prominent first century non-Christian Roman historians. And there's also this simple little fact that the Romans knew how to kill people. And if they decided they were going to crucify someone, they were going to do it, especially if they had any sort of fear in the back of their mind that someone might have possibly been someone who might have caused some sort of possible political uprising or rebellion or strife of which they thought Jesus might. And so the Romans knew how to crucify people and they were going to get it done when they threw this guy Jesus up on the cross. So the first fact that we can establish is Jesus died by crucifixion. R. Any clue what R might be? Ah, uh, that's a good guess. But no, that's the conclusion of the five facts. R is going to be the radical conversion of Paul and James. So we all mentioned Paul. Well, many people, excuse me, mentioned Paul as one of their favorite biblical figures or characters. Um, James, speaking specifically of James, the brother of Jesus. Okay. Now, now we know that both of these people were individuals who at one point were against Jesus. Okay. Paul in a much more ferocious sort of manner. Um, we know that he was one who was an opponent of the faith, that he specifically was one who killed, persecuted, murdered Christians. Okay, but after a particular experience, he became one of the faith's most able defenders. Skeptics would agree with this. Paul was against Christianity. He became for it. Something happened in between there. And um, we might get to talk a little bit about this guy later, Anthony Flew. He, he's a really interesting individual. He, he's actually um, now deceased, but he was a very prominent atheist turned theist because of certain arguments about the resurrection. Here's what he said. He said, read Romans. Paul obviously wrote Romans. And he said, and you will know that Paul is a first-rate philosophical mind. Paul was brilliant. So when we're talking about the conversion of this man named Paul from a Christian hater to one of the Christian propagators, we're not talking about some erratic, whimsical, 
loser who couldn't really think for himself. We're talking about one of the most bright, learned, educated men of the first century. That's who we're talking about, and that should at least be considered when we think about and put together all these facts we're going to. James was Jesus' brother. We know that he strongly doubted Jesus was indeed the Messiah. He doubted a lot of the claims of Jesus. However, we know that Jesus, we'll get to it, we know that James then um, later on became a proponent of the Christian message up to his death. Okay? Anyone who studies the field would say, yep, the lives of those two people radically changed by something. Okay? So we're building a case to get to a conclusion. E is the empty tomb of Jesus. Okay, We have lots of reasons to believe that this tomb that Jesus' dead body was placed in a few days later was empty. And the body that was there wasn't there anymore. Okay, Lots of reasons to believe that. Here's just a few. One of them is the Jerusalem factor. Um, I don't know, any of you guys, uh, raise your hand if you guys live off campus. You guys live off campus. Okay. Almost all of you guys. Okay, gotcha. Um, so, Tyler here, you live in Farmhouse, right? Okay, so AGR is like your guys' favorite fraternity, right? Yep. <laughs> okay, okay, good deal, good deal. So, if, if, you know, Cross came up to you and goes, hey, Tyler, man, you know, something really, really crazy happened today. You know, what's that? He goes, man, someone set off a nuclear bomb in AGR's front yard. <laughs> what are you going to do? I would find that man and I would call him. You would, you would, and you'd give him a high five, and you say thank, whatever, whatever. But if you wanted to actually check out the authenticity of this claim, what would you do? I'd probably go to AGR and see if there's anything to do there. That makes complete sense, considering they're like what 200 yards from your house. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, so, so you would have to put aside three minutes of your day to make the little 200 yard walk to see if it really went off, because there's going to be like clear evidence that a bomb went off, right? If he told you, hey man, a bomb went off at this fraternity called AGR in China. Diff different AGR, I don't know, apparently it's an AGR in China. You gonna go check out that claim? What? You gonna go check out that claim? Person, no. No, of course not, right? So which one is more easily falsifiable? The one in China. No, yeah, the one in China. The AGR that's close, right? The one's 200 yards away. Yep, that's close. Because you can just go, Check it out. Okay, we, we, we can check this out. And so if Cross is going to make this claim, it's pretty easy for you to determine whether he's right or wrong, whether it's true or false. You just go look at it. And so we know that the earliest Christians were preaching the message of Jesus in the empty tomb in Jerusalem where it happened. They had to take a short little stroll that wasn't more than a Sabbath walk to go see if that was really true. They weren't saying, hey, some guy rose and now the tomb's empty. It's, you know, 300 miles away. Go get on a horse and check it out. They were saying, right outside our city, a guy was buried and he's not there anymore. If you wanted to, like, prove that wasn't true, it's pretty easy. You just like go see if the tomb is empty, right? And so we call it the Jerusalem factor. It just means that the message was first proclaimed where the event actually took place, which gives a higher probability that that event did indeed take place. Uh, this is also leads into our next part, which is it, it was attested to be true, not just by the early Christians and those who like preached, yeah, Jesus rose from the dead, but even those who preached Jesus didn't rise from the dead still acknowledged the empty tomb. Okay, we see this in lots of different places. One of them is in the Gospel of Matthew, where we see some of the Roman authorities say, hey, um, yeah, we don't know what to do about that, so we're going to we're gonna make something work to make sure these people have a reason to believe that something happened here, but it wasn't this man actually rising from the dead. And so the very fact that a claim is attested not just by the proponents, but also by the enemies, makes it much more verifiable that it did indeed, and did indeed happen. Paul Meyer, a distinguished professor of the ancient history, uh, Western Michigan says Jewish polemics, meaning um, Jews who, who attacked Christians, shared with Christians, both of them held the conviction that the sepulcher or the tomb was empty, but gave natural explanations for it. And such positive evidence within a hostile source, J the Jewish polemics, is the strongest kind of evidence. Okay, Enemy attested. 
Finally, this is just building a case, okay? None of these stand on their own. The final one is that the primary witnesses to this event were women, at least as written about in the four gospel accounts that we have. And if one was to invent an account of an empty tomb, it would be most likely to invent an account in which males specifically were the first eyewitnesses to the scene. The reason being that their testimony and their witnesses would be heard, more so over that of a woman for sure, especially in first century Greco-Roman history. And so an unlikely invention by the early Christians given that the status of women specifically in Jewish and Greco-Roman culture was much lower and much more denigrated. Okay? So it shows that there's a much higher likelihood that this indeed was the case. D. What was D? Death. Death. R was? Radical transformation of Paul and James. Okay. And E was, we got it up here, the empty tomb. Okay. We're simply establishing things that are historical bedrock facts. That's all we're doing right now. We got two more left. A is that there were appearances. Okay, if you want, you could maybe even kind of, you know, put suppose it around this if you want. We'll get to what I mean by that. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 8. Okay, like I said, 1 Corinthians 15 is your resurrection chapter. And this is a really interesting text. I wish I could get into it more when you start listening to any sort of debates around the resurrection. This is going to be the top biblical text that you're going to hear people kind of quibbling and quabbling about. And this is Paul saying that, hey, um, this is the gospel, you know, Christ died, buried, raised again. Then he goes into six resurrection appearances. Six resurrection appearances. Notice three of them are individual. He says Jesus appeared to Paul, to James, and to Peter. And then he gives three group appearances. He appeared to the twelve. We assume that's the twelve disciples or the twelve apostles. More than five hundred. Okay, supposedly we could probably infer that this is a group of people that all in some way or another believed in or to some capacity followed Jesus. And then all the apostles. Okay, so that's probably a group of the twelve plus some others as well. Okay. Okay. Three individual appearances, three group appearances. Okay. Now, Bart Ehrman says, again, top Christian skeptic of our day. Okay. And this is, this is an educated, intellectual man, PhD. He currently lectures, previously was at Duke, now he's at UNC. He says that we can trace this material, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 8, to, get this, one year after the cross. One year. So if you say the cross, Christ's resurrection happened in 30 AD, he says we can trace this material right here to 31 AD. Okay. Now, it'd take me a while to explain how or why, Okay, and, and, and we could get into that if we had more time. Um, sadly, we're not going to be able to have that time. But he says, as a skeptic, that this here, this message, what Paul says, is not something that was just kind of came into Paul's mind when Paul wrote this letter of 1 Corinthians in 54 AD. He says what Paul is writing in 1 Corinthians 15 is actually something that has been an early church creed, meaning that the early church had this as, as kind of almost as if like a, a liturgical piece similar to maybe a high church today that has, you know, the Apostles' Creed that they read as part of their service or, or the Lord's Prayer they read as part of their service. That this was an early creed that the church developed and it was in circulation throughout the entirety of where the church existed one year after the cross. Okay, that's very, very powerful. And so a unanimous consensus of, again, skeptics and critics agree that because of this here and the fact that this is in circulation a year after the cross, we can say that the disciples had experiences that they sincerely believed were resurrection appearances of Jesus. Okay. Skeptics and critics will give you that. I've never watched a debate where someone doesn't give them that. Okay. The non-Christian will say, yeah, we give you that. 
They believed that they had experiences in which they saw the resurrected Jesus. That's another historical bedrock fact that we're going to have as part of a building case to get to our conclusion. The final one is one that we hear a lot. The apostles all died for professing their faith. I want to mention something real quick. Okay, As Christians, sometimes we can be bad about this. We get really excited and amped up and we're so certain and confident that, that we have the right points and we have good arguments. And Sometimes when we actually try to make our case, we actually overstate the case. So yeah, we do have some things on our side, but we state it more strongly than we actually should. Okay? And th this is an area where we do. And so I just want to caution a few people on this real quick. This is an area where for the longest time in my sort of kind of street apologetics time, I overstated the case. Okay? Um, you guys at all familiar with Sean or his dad? His dad's kind of a little bit of a big wig too. The McDowell last name obviously rings some bells in the apologetic cir circles. Um, but why am I blanking right now? Sean's dad's name is uh, Josh. Josh. I was like, what? Josh McDowell, his father, the one of whom um, the movie Case for Cr No, what's the movie called? Now that's over Lee Strobel, isn't it? Yeah. I'm blanking. Now I look dumb. Sean McDowell's dad still wrote some really good books. Case for Christ, Case for Creator. We're both him, right? Or were those Strobel? Josh wrote more than a writer. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and evidence that demands a verdict. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Correct. So thank you for getting me there. Um, so Sean McDowell, he, he's done more research in this area than anyone else regarding the deaths of the 12 apostles. Okay. And basically he sums it up by saying this. For the longest time, Christian apologists have always got up and said, you know, all of the 12 apostles died as martyrs for their faith, except for John, because he was exiled on the island of Patmos. And it's not actually that clear as we look historically that this can actually be verified in a real strong and authentic way. There's strong evidence to believe that at least four were definitely martyred. Peter, Paul, James, and John. Good evidence to believe that two others were likely martyred, Andrew and Thomas, but for the rest, we don't really know. Like maybe, maybe not. We don't really know. The sources for these other names come a lot, lot later. There's a lot more kind of conflicting details regarding um, their deaths. For the first group, those are all first century sources. For the second group, those are all second. For this group here, they're all fourth, fifth century sources that come a lot later. They're a lot less in number and they're not quite as clear in the details. And so we can say strongly, hey, at, least, at least four Christians were definitely killed and martyred for professing their faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay. So the key is not to show that all of them actually died because of their faith. They didn't. But it's to show that they were willing to die. And there was a willingness for them to give their life for the message of this man, Jesus of Nazareth. And so the apostles dying for their faith in the resurrection by no means makes it true. It's really easy for someone who starts to hear this argument like, well, people die for lies all the time. It's like, yeah, you're right. Of course, absolutely fully. But no one dies for something that they know is a lie. And as the pithy phrase says, liars make poor martyrs. Okay? Martyrdom does not demonstrate that the message is true, that the person is teaching or preaching, but it does show that they're sincere in their belief that it's true. Okay? And here's my conclusion from this, and then it's going to get to us finishing with this argument. I would say that if any of us were part of the 12 who followed Jesus for three years and we see this man who has done all these miraculous and supernatural things accused by Roman governors and authorities whipped, beaten, and lashed, taken to a cross, hung up, he ends up dying, and then we see a spear shoved through his side and pulled back out, and we see this man named Joseph Arimathea, who was kind of in our group, but he was kind of fringely associated, take him and put him in a tomb. You don't really have any reason to believe that that man actually came back to life. You don't really have any reason to believe it. 
less. He actually really, truly appeared to you in physical, bodily, resurrected form. To me, that's the only reason it actually makes you think that he actually really rose from the dead. Okay. I think that's at least a somewhat compelling argument to make. So here's the conclusion of the case that we've been building. Five facts, okay, we summed it up with the acronym DREAM, okay, I just want someone to, to shout them out real quick, don't look up here yet, okay. Uh, D was? Death. Death of Jesus. R was? Radical, Radical transformation. transformation. Da, 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 those two. Um, e was? A was? Appearances. The disciples thought that they saw appearances of Jesus in resurrected form, and M was? Martyrdom. Okay. So the, these are, again, established bedrock facts that we can get historians who study this area to all say, yep, agree, on board fully. So to conclude this argument, I believe that the bodily resurrection of Jesus is the best explanation for the combination of all of these facts. Everyone goes, no, 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 I, I don't like that resurrection of Jesus. No, 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 not at all. I'm not, I'm not letting you go there. So, okay, okay, that's, 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 that's cool. But here's the deal. You have to do one of two things. If you're going to deny that best explanation being the resurrection of Jesus, you have to either put forth a more reasonable or a probable explanation. So that's to be some sort of alternative explanation to say, hey, all these five facts are still true but Jesus didn't rise from the dead and here's how all those five facts are still true and Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Or you have to deny one of the facts. Which means that, hey, th 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 you, you can deny a fact that's held to by the vast majority of contemporary scholars, for sure. But you need to give solid, strong evidence and argumentation as to why you can deny it. Say, no, the tomb wasn't empty. Okay, well, why don't you give me five reasons as to why it wasn't? Because I could give you three strong ones as to why it was. Okay. <laughs> Let me tell you a story, and I'm not going to say whether or not this story is indeed true or whether this story is false. It's just a story, and you can determine whether it's true or false. Its truthfulness doesn't really have any bearing on the story itself. Now Alan's laughing. You want to tell the story, Alan? No. Okay. So I actually went golfing with Alan a while back. <laughs> <laughs> As we do, yeah. I was just kind of trying to climb the ladder of, you know, business individuals in Manhattan. As you guys know that my friend Alan is a part owner of Cold Stone Creamery. And so, you know, it's kind of one of those, like, I want to be associated with him. Kind of thing, you know, I want to go golfing with that guy. Can you take me to Colbert Hills? You got the money. We can make it work. You know, good tea time. We went. And, um, I'm not really much of a golfing man. I didn't grow up. I, I grew up on a farm, okay? I grew up on a farm. Farmers just don't golf. They don't. And so, you know, I don't want to make a fool of myself. And we're at the first hole. He gives me the, I said, almost said putter, but clearly it's not a putter. The stick that you're supposed to use to hit the ball really far. <laughs> the driver. <laughs> Put that thing on the tee. And um, it was kind of crazy how it was all going just because of, you know, the direction of the sun and all that. But, you know, I wind up and I smack the ball. And because of the direction of the sun and all that, you know, um, we couldn't really see the ball. We just, it, it went a long way. You know, that, that hole was a long way off, too. The ball went a long way. Okay. And, and Alan, he's a veteran at golf, and so he tees off, and he, hit, he hits a good one. Solid connection with that ball. So we go look, and, and uh, we find Alan's ball, you know, and um, it's relatively close to the hole. But we keep looking, we keep looking, we keep looking, we keep looking. We look for a few minutes, and then we look even longer, and we can't find the ball that I hit. We can't find the ball I hit. And so we keep looking, we keep looking, and finally after like, you know, 15 minutes ago, Alan, I just got an idea. Here's what I said, man, maybe, maybe it went in the hole. He's like, no, no, man. I'm like, I know, I know, I'm not a good golfer. I grew up on a farm, it's only my second time golfing. Maybe it went in the hole and I got a hole in one. He goes, you know, all right, let's just go check. So we drive the little golf cart around, and, and sure enough, there's a ball in the hole. <laughs> And so I'm elated, I'm excited, I'm jumping up and down. So I go, the ball stinking, I, I had a hole in one, you know? <laughs> Second time golf and I had a hole in one. It took Tiger Woods like 10 years to do that. I've got a bright future. <laughs> and um, 
Alan, if you know him, he can sometimes be a naysayer. <laughs> he can be a skeptic. <laughs> and so I'm like, hey man, here's the facts we know. Like I hit the ball, the sun was bright, and we found a ball in the hole. Those are the facts, man. And he goes, Ty, there's other explanations for this though. I said, okay, give me your explanation. He goes, well Ty, anyone who knows Colbert Hills knows that there's a high population of chipmunks at Colbert Hills. <laughs> And because there's a really high population of chipmunks, it's very likely that you hit the ball completely off course, but a chipmunk, out of just feeling a lot of sympathy for you and a lot of pity for you, went and grabbed that ball, carried it over to the hole while I was teeing off and doing all that stuff, and spit it in the hole. And I'm like, you know what, Alan? You could be right. It's possible. It's possible. I don't think it's probable, but it's possible. And so, you know, I kind of start thinking, and then all of a sudden that I, I, I realize my friend Joe May works at Colbert Hills. And, and Joe specifically works in the area of security at Colbert Hills. So I call him up, and Joe goes, hey man, you know what's crazy is we actually have video that shows like the whole of each of the 18 holes, live video feed all the time. We keep it for 24 hours that shows what's going on at the hole in a 10 foot radius of the hole. I go, okay, cool, man, shoot us over a video of what happened at, you know, maybe like 20 minutes ago because there was a ball that went in the hole and I think it's mine. And so he goes, okay, you know. So he sends us video and, and sure enough, we see the ball rolling into the hole, not carried by a chipmunk. <laughs> <laughs> but Alan goes, you know, there are chipmunks that have really, really strong mouth muscles. And it's quite possible that the chipmunk actually stood 11 feet radius from the hole, spit the ball 10 feet plus one more because he was out of the shot because he knew where it was specifically taping and the ball went in the hole. And I go, you know what, Alan? It's possible but it's not probable. And I'm not just looking for possible explanations, I'm looking for probable explanations. And by the way, Alan, can you give me any instance ever where a chipmunk has ever done this? <laughs> like you're presenting an alternative explanation, but you're not giving me reasons to believe in that explanation. You're just presenting a hypothetical. You're not explaining why it's rational. And Alan goes, you know, Ty, I've been thinking. And there might actually be another alternative explanation of how that ball's in the hole. And you still didn't get a hole in one. I'm not believing it. I said, okay, man, what, what is it? He goes, you know, so, so the guy who was golfing in front of us, okay, that man's name was Johnny Coleman, and he's a little erratic. <laughs> Johnny Coleman's kind of crazy. And I bet what happened is that Johnny, that he actually hit the ball in the hole, you know, he not necessarily the hole in one, but he got it in. And then he, for some reason or another, just forgot to pick up his ball. He forgot to pick it up and went to the next hole. And so you're stumbling upon his ball, not yours. And I go, oh man, it's true. But Johnny's a friend of mine. So I give Johnny a call, you know. Johnny, you're on the golf course, right? You're a whole lot of us. Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. I go, hey, did you, you've already golfed hole one. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I said, uh, and um, did you by any chance like leave your, your ball in the hole for any reason? No, man, no, I didn't. I never do that. I always pick up my ball from the hole. Why would I do that? That's stupid. Oh, yeah, that's stupid. You're right, you know. <laughs> Thanks, Johnny, you know, hang up. And Alan goes, you know, I know Johnny's a godly man, full of integrity and honesty, but sometimes that man lies. <laughs> and it's possible he's lying to you. I say, you know what? That's possible, but it's not probable. Because I've known Johnny for quite a few years, and I can say he's a man of integrity. And even if he lies, he wouldn't lie about his golf game. Okay? <laughs> and so I said, man, you're giving me an alternative explanation to how this ball ended up in the hole and how all the facts still fit, but you're explanation is only possible, it's not really probable, and you're not giving me any reasons to believe it. Here's the deal. I think you know where this is going, but this is what a lot of people do with the resurrection. They say, well, well, well maybe, maybe Jesus' disciples went and stole the body, they dug a tomb, and then they threw it in it, and then they planted flowers over it to make it, you know, look pretty and like a little garden or something. It's like, okay. <laughs> Can you give me one reason why that makes any sense? Or maybe two reasons why 
there's good reason to believe that this happened because I just gave you 15 reasons to believe why the thing that I said happened. Nah, nah, it's just a possibility. Here's the thing. Historical claims are not made based upon what's possible, but upon what's probable. Okay? And so if someone wants to sit here and give you an alternative explanation, like Alan did, he has to give good reason to believe why his explanation is possible and probable. Now here's the deal, my hole in one is pretty darn unlikely. Again, I'm a bum fud from central Kansas. I didn't even know what the thing was called that I hit it with. But it's still possible that happened and unlikely things do indeed happen. And it's a lot more likely, I think, that we score a hole in one. That happens way more often, even though it's crazy unlikely. Like most golfers only do it like if they're lucky once in their life. That still happens a lot more often than chipmunks spitting a ball 11 feet to roll into a hole, right? <laughs> I think we all agree on that. And I just want to add one quick thing. Someone goes, yeah, well see, here's when your argument just falls apart because dead people don't come back to life. That's not true. And, and I encourage you guys to actually, if you have time, it's, if you have 70 bucks that you just want to spend on a book that you're not going to fully read, but it's cool to have on your bookshelf, buy a book called Miracles by Craig Keener. Okay, Craig Keener is the most prominent New Testament scholar of our day and age, and he has written a book that he couldn't even fit into one book, so he had to make it two. It's 1,600 some odd pages, and he talks about verified miracle accounts that happen throughout the world. And there's, he literally divides it up by sections of the world that they happen in because there's so many. He's like, oh, people rising from the dead in Latin America, people rising from the dead in Russia, people rising from the dead in Central Asia. Strong evidential reason to believe that a lot of these happen. People do indeed rise from the dead and our Western anti-supernaturalistic <laughs> bias pushes back against it and says, no way, we're smarter than that. But, but they're going to have to deal with some of the real scholarship that's being done in this area by some of these guys like Craig Keener. Okay? So people do rise from the dead. We have lots of reasons to believe Jesus did. It's the best explanation for the five facts. Just like me getting a hole in one is the best explanation over and above what Alan's alternative explanation were. Hopefully you guys see where I'm coming from. These are some other theories and explanations that are put forth by different people. Um, you can look at them. You've probably heard these before if you've ever kind of dealt with people in this area. I'd like to be able to discuss all of them, but I don't think we have time, so I'm sorry. Maybe we can do this another time. Some people say, well, maybe Jesus didn't actually die, so they're denying one of the five bedrock facts. He just appeared to die. Okay, well, explain that. Why do you think this? Give reasons to believe this. Okay. Uh, second would be called the fraud theory, which is just, again, the disciples stole the body from Jesus' tomb. They still have a lot of explaining to do. Um, it, the whole martyrdom piece obviously wouldn't make sense, and we could go through some of that. Um, this is probably the most prevalent, the hallucination theory, um, which, ex which, which acknowledges all five of these historical facts, and then says, but the appearances weren't actually true bodily resurrected appearances. It was just something that happened in the mind of those who were followers of Jesus that didn't happen in reality. It was a hallucination, okay? Um, there, there's, there's lots of ways to push back against that and give some strong counter arguments to that explanation. We don't have time. But here's what I want to actually kind of end with. Ephesians 1. This is not the minimal facts argument anymore. We've moved on. It says, I pray that the eyes of your heart, this is Paul praying, He's praying for the eyes of the hearts of the Ephesians. This is a prayer that also can be extended to any contemporary Christian as well. May be enlightened. I know that you may know the hope to which he, God has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the holy people, and God's incomparably great power. For who? Those who believe, those who are born again and dwelt by the Spirit of God, followers of Jesus. 
He says, I want them to realize there's an incomparably great power in those people. Now, I imagine that, that probably describes most of the people here. Even though I don't know you all personally, um, I imagine there's a reason that you guys showed up here. I, I know some of you guys, obviously. I'm sure you guys have a real testimony. And Paul says that that power is the same as the mighty strength that God exerted when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. So there's a mighty power exerted in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He said that same extent, that same measure of power lives and dwells within us if we're really Christians. That's powerful, my friends. Fellow Christians, that is powerful. Okay? And so here's the reality. I, I, I want you guys, I, I'm, I'm going to be honest for like 45 seconds, and then I want you guys to be honest for a few. I think, if you haven't noticed, I think there's good reason to believe in the resurrection. I think that we have like absolutely, completely, fully, great, tremendous, awesome evidence, and I think that we should definitely use it had nothing to do with why I started following Jesus. Nothing to do with it. Okay? No, no one actually presented this to me. Like, oh, dang, I consider it. And, okay, now, for some people, yes, that's their story and that's their testimony. For me, it had nothing to do with it. This has, has bolstered, it has strengthened my faith because it's given me some strong reasons to believe that the Christian faith is rational. I just figured I'd throw that word in there because of what club I'm at, you know? <laughs> Um, so, so for sure, completely, I didn't come to faith because of this. I come to faith because a few guys who lived in Haymaker Hall lived a life that honored Jesus and was compelling. And they shared the gospel with me. And God did something real powerful and strong in my heart. And in some way, he revealed himself to me. And I said, I think that's true. Later, I got some really good reasons to think that it's true. At that time, it wasn't about the resurrection. It wasn't about the moral argument or the argument of human dignity, which I think is spectacular that you presented, Abby. And so here's the deal. I sit out on campus every now and then. I have a white boy, you know, I talk to people about the Christian faith. Most people don't listen to me. Some do, and I talk to those people, and that's what, those are the people that I go to. Those are the people that I go for. Okay, But most Christians won't actually listen to these. Most non-Christians, excuse me. Some of them will. And some of them are that, you know, like thoughtful minds, you know, like, okay, I actually want to hear this. I actually want to consider. I actually want to contemplate. I, I really want to know. Most won't. Some will. A lot won't. Okay. But everyone will watch the way that you live. And here's the question, it's already there, so it's not a spoiler, but if your life was the only example of resurrection power and all the stuff I just told you about minimal facts didn't exist, would the person who's watching your life believe in resurrection power? It's a real question we have to ask. Like that incomparably great power that Paul says is really in those who believe, is it something that the bystander would be like, oh yeah, yeah. I see that they have, they have the power to love those who hate them. That's, that's, wow, that's powerful. I see they have the power to overcome very destructive habits and addictions. You know, I see that, that, that they have the power to reach out to people and see people who are in a state of darkness come into a state of light. They have the, people, the ability to help those who are in depression and riddled with anxiety come out and walk in stability and sanity. Yeah, I see that power in their life. Would people say those kinds of things about you if they didn't hear your arguments, they just saw your life? That's more important than knowing the minimal facts and all the background with it. I can promise you that. I know where I'm at, and so I know that you guys probably, you know, watch, you know, a little Frank Turek here and there, you know, or watch a little Jay Warner Wallace when we want, you know, good stuff, okay? And so you're always going to hear, what's the number one apologetics verse? Come on. What's our top apologetics verse in the Bible? It's the first Peter one. First Peter. Three. Can, can someone get us a verse? Fifteen. Can someone quote first Peter 3.15 for us? This is the only verse in the entirety of the Bible that uses the word that we now have in English as apologetics. Apologia. Anyone quote it for us? But always be ready for anyone who asks to give the reason for the hope that you have. Thank you, Cross. Thank you. First Peter 3.15. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Here's the question I have for you Christians. Do you live in such a way 
that people ask you for the reason the hope you have. Because when we hear this verse, all we hear is, yeah, yeah, look at that, look at that, I need to give an answer. I need to give an answer, man. Because everyone's coming up to me and asking about the arguments for God. I need to give an answer, you know. Everyone, huh, if you, you know, everyone's coming up to me and they're, they're, they're coming to me with, you know, those questions about, well, why does it say in this passage that Satan incited David to take the sins? In this passage, it was Yahweh who incited him. Which one is it? You know, no one's ever asked me that question. I spent hours preparing to answer that question. No one's ever asked it to me. And so in apologetics, we spend so much time being prepared to give an answer. But we, we oftentimes don't spend as much time as thinking about what the verse actually says. Which is, yeah, be prepared to give an answer. Which is this. Figuring this stuff out, learning this stuff, reading this stuff. But it's initiated by someone else. Those answers are in response to the person who initiates because they see you live with a hope. You live with a hope. And so, what's the best apologetic out there? It's not minimal facts. It's living with a hope. It's living with a hope that the resurrection's real and the resurrection has real implications for us. As 1 Corinthians 15 says, that because Christ raised, that means that we indeed will be raised as well. And that the wimpy, piddly body that I have now will one day be resurrected in immortal and glorious power when I get to reign with God in His kingdom forever. That's a hope. And when we live with that hope, when we talk and function and operate in that hope, then people will ask us questions. Then we can have the apologetics ready. First, we need to live in the way that would make people ask for the reason, for the hope that we have.